Ladies and gentlemen, Malcolm, thank you very much indeed. Malcolm, not least, thank you for giving my presentation. Um, the next few minutes will be a fairly quiet one, I'm pleased to say. Um, so, um, gosh, it doesn't seem a year ago since I was doing this presentation, talking about what was going on then. And in that last year, as you'll see in the next few minutes, things have got busier. Uh, and, and if we can gauge the activity in our industry by the numbers in the audience today, then that is a, a very clear message of quite what is going on in our industry in 2013. So what, what a difference maybe a year, maybe two years make. Um, uh, what we've put up here are, are some of the headlines for the report this year. And uh, they come into sort of three main clusters. Uh, record investment, and we'll come a bit more into that in a minute. Uh, record production downturn, I think there's no polite way to say that. Expiration at a low point. Uh, poor reserves replacement. The physics of the basin is looking very strange. A lot of really big forces acting on the basin at the minute. Uh, then against that, we've got some big changes, as Malcolm mentioned, on the policy side. Uh, a continued and progressive change in the tax regime with a whole range of new field and brownfield concessions. Uh, decommissioning certainty. Uh, and then the results that are really what we see now. Growing confidence in the sector. Uh, strong employment and strong employment growth, uh, and indeed a very dynamic and very engaged supply chain. As always with uh, these sort of presentations, I can't but resist sticking up the oil price, if nothing else to remind us uh, quite how much we are reliant on it. Uh, it's always going to be a key marker in our industry, and yes, we, as we all know, the UK is a, an expensive place to do business. It is undoubtedly more comfortable at high oil prices. Certainly, if we were to see a, a prolonged period of $80 or less in oil price, there would be a great deal more discomfort in this room than we see at these current prices. And they have been remarkably steady. Despite some major gyrations, oil price has been around $111 the last two years. And uh, with exchange rates being fairly steady, at least until this week, um, then uh, oil prices hold around £70 a barrel, which is a pretty high price indeed for... Uh, for pounds sterling for oil. What's also uh, uh, remarkable and remains so, as you'll see, we show the picture there of the gas price as well. And gas prices for much of these last two years at least uh, have continued that separation with oil price and they're still only about half of oil price. There looks to be a slight upturn, but even so, gas is still well, well down compared with oil price uh, and will take a while, I think, still even to get, that, get back to that historic average, if you like, of around two-thirds gas to oil price. If that's the backdrop, what I'd like to do then is really move on to the physics of the basin and look at the store cupboard, if you like, or the reserves opportunity here in, in the UKCS. It's quite a complicated picture, this one, so if you don't mind, if you hang in there with me, uh, I'd like to take you through where we are at the start of the year and what we see going on at the minute. From my point of view, a year ago when I was standing here, I was reasonably cheerful to say that we had about 7.1 billion barrels of oil and gas that either were in production or being currently worked on and uh, were projects on the way, if you like. So they were connected reserves still to come on stream. Over the last year, production has been uh, just over half a billion barrels, not a good year for production, but in contrast, we have added... Uh, 0.8 of a billion barrels of new reserves. So at the end of last year, the start of this year, our stock cupboard, our store cupboard, was the highest it's been for six years. And that's great because that is, you need to have something in your store cupboard in our industry. You can't run on empty. You can't run where that, that, uh, that, that shows the fuel gauge is nearly empty. So for us, having a strong reserve space and having strong sanctioned reserves is very much part of the business. The good news is, then on top of that, we have another 2.5 billion barrels that companies are actively working on and stand a pretty fair chance of being developed as projects. So those are a whole range of new field developments uh, and quite a lot of brown field developments as well. So the light blue is the new field, uh, the light brown is, light orange, whatever, is, is brown fields. So that shows you, if you like, our store cupboard at the minute uh, is, is looking pretty good. It's uh, nearly 10 billion barrels and was the same a year ago, and considering we've produced half a billion barrels in between, that feels like a good place. So we've got more reserves either in production 
or on the way to being in production, and we're working actively at getting the next chunk going. In comparison with that, then, if you look at the total figure, when you look and see also things which are well down the priority list, uh, that sort of, but are still being thought about, if you like, the less than 50% chance of being developed stuff, then that adds up to just over 11 billion barrels. Uh, and, and it's a big number, but a year ago that was 11.9 billion barrels. And what it's showing is that we're struggling to get new reserves into development, into the queue of being considered as projects to mature and get on stream. And for us as an industry, that's a big tension. So it's great we're actually eating in our store cupboard, bringing more food down to the bottom shelf and getting it into production. But what we've got to do is find more things to get into the queue to be developed and then ultimately to get into production. The other remarkable thing, and I show here in, in red, are the amounts of capital flying through this basin at the minute. For the stuff that is either in production or being developed, currently actively being developed, our plans at the start of this year show we're spending £44 billion. For the stuff that we're thinking about uh, firmly, another £30 billion. And the stuff that's a twinkle in the eye, another £25 billion. If my maths is about right, that adds up to just under £100 billion worth of capital being targeted by our industry at this basin. And that is remarkable. Those are huge sums of money. Only four years ago, that number was about 30 billion pounds. The total in our basin has grown threefold over the last four to five years. And that, that shows both what we can do and the fact that most of this money is generated by this industry. We don't, we don't need subsidies. We don't, we don't need support for this. This is our day job. Uh, the renewable sector that manages struggling to find the funds over the next seven years, about 100 billion pounds to develop its industry. And we're sitting here saying, well, this is the day job, this is what we do. Uh, a big change, a big contrast to that industry. So it's also just worth reflecting where are, where are the growth areas and where is all this money being poured into at the minute. Uh, and... Um, yeah, clearly, as you see from this picture here, um, on, on, on the left-hand side, the West of Shetlands, through to the Southern North Sea on the right, uh, what we see, the dark grey stuff shows the, shows the reserves that are already in production, and the lighter grey shows the stuff either uh, ongoing investments through to possible reserves at the top. And you can see clearly, the Central North Sea is still kingpin. But over the next four or five years, the West of Shetlands is going to change dramatically as some of the big developments come on stream. It will still lag behind the Central North Sea for quite some years to come, but it's on the way. So a big change, you know, what we are seeing, though, is investment across the sector, right across all of the regions of the UK sector of the North Sea, which, again, is very positive, so it shows that all of the cases are being advanced and that business is focusing on all the opportunities. What I'd like to do now, again, this is a pretty unexciting graph in one sense, but it's a, a massively dramatic one in others. This is a picture of investment over this last decade. The black line shows how it's grown since 2009, uh, and then the colour lines show our forecast over the last few years. Uh, and there are several eye-catching things from this. First of all, if we look, last year, 2012, we invested just over £11 billion. Uh, now, you, uh, these are just huge numbers. We spent another eight billion on top just to run our businesses here in the UK uh, to operate the North Sea. Uh, the figures are massive compared with any other industry. We are truly the biggest investor in the UK economy. And what's even more remarkable is that in 2013, we can see investment growing stronger yet again and rising to about 13 and a half billion pounds this year maybe still even a little bit of upside on that. And no, that's not inflation. Yes, there's some inflation in it, and I know uh, we'll hear a little bit of that in a few minutes. But most of that is actually ac uh, new activities. Uh, and uh, at the back of the report, you can see the numbers of fields that have been given development approval in the last year, and over the last three years, how that's grown from nine in 2010 through to 28 in 2012. A significant change, a significant growth in activity. I also think it's uh, very important, if you see, after 2005, investment fell, fell back quite dramatically. That's nothing to do with the tax increase in 2006, of course. 
but it's quite curious that at a time when between 2003 and 2009, so most of the noughties, oil price increased threefold. But in comparison, uh, investment sort of staggered up by about 50%. And that shows the poor response we made at the time to what were very changing and frankly ought to be massively attractive circumstances to invest in the UK. And it came so much so that by 2009, uh, our investment, okay, we were spending money, but, but not really making much progress. Uh, and in 2009, we spent something like £2 billion on new projects. It's a bit more because other projects were going on, but two, uh, 2009, about £2 billion. Whereas in 2011 12, we spent something like £20 billion bringing on new projects. So a big difference, and we see that not least when you come look at production in a few minutes. So we've seen, for much of the first decade of the century, the 2000s, frankly, investment was underwhelming. It took a big step up in 2008. It started to look hard. 2009, it really rose up. And then, on the last few years, investment is at an all-time high, quite literally. The last time it was as strong as uh, last year was 30 years ago, and there is no case where we've seen investment higher than we expect over the next couple of years. Now, if that's good news, uh, I would temper that slightly. Inflation isn't what it used to be. So you get an awful lot less oil for your pound now than you did five or ten years ago, and way less than inflation alone would tell you. So, for instance, ten years ago, uh, we would see five times more buying power for a pound than you do now. And that inevitably means you have to spend a lot more to get these opportunities out of the ground. But nonetheless, these are massive figures. And again, what you see in the report is that, uh, as I mentioned, these activities are spread right across the UKCS. Uh, and the grey blobs show the activity through 2011, the black ones through 2012, uh, and they are centred right across the business. It's also interesting to see how much things have grown. So 2011, there were 17 new field developments or, or new projects, and that grew to 28 last year. Over the last two years, we've seen £22 billion of capital sanctioned on new projects, on top of what was already ongoing, lag and or a whole range of other stuff that was going on already in 2009 and 2010. And that big wave of investment is what's driving through to see these results. And as Malcolm said, why, why, why is that? A lot of that really was put at peril in 2011. Uh, and uh, I, I compared with the last tax increase before that, I think the government took the industry a lot more seriously when we said this is not right. What we've seen since then are a range of tax changes, subtle ones, there are no free lunches here, but what they have done is where investment has really caught on the edge. They've managed to nudge it across the line by small changes to the regime. A classic one was Mariner, which has just now been sanctioned. Uh, a small change to ring fence expenditure supplement, and most of you won't ever spend a day worrying about this, I'm pleased to say, has meant that for them they can carry their costs of de development forward uh, at a slightly higher interest rate, and for them that gets that investment across the line. So what the government has done is mostly make small changes which give good results and get more investments going. Probably the best change it could have done was sit on its hands through much of the last decade. Unfortunately, that's the one thing governments don't tend to do. I would also say there's due credit, they are thinking hard with others about the life of infrastructure, and as Malcolm mentioned, decommissioning is key to what a lot of, what a lot of things are doing at the minute. It's worth just looking again at the physics of, of the wave of investment. I'll just picture here the capital investment that we sanctioned in the last two years. So that started to pick up in 2011 and peaks this year at about £6 billion of the total of £13 billion that we see this year. And that goes on for many years, in fact. So small cap, uh, bits of capital already are being signalled going through to 2030 from the wave of investments that we're doing now. Now, clearly, that provides employment right across the sector, right across the UK. It doesn't pay any production taxes yet, but for each billion pounds we spend something like 10 to 15,000 people get jobs or remain employed by our sector. So this is a very powerful tonic to the UK economy. On top of that, we get oil and gas, praise be, from the work that we do. And so that money gradually gets converted to production, and by 2017, it's producing about half a million barrels of oil and gas a day. 
Uh, and this dynamic, dynamic is what's going to pull production back up from the real low that we're sitting in 2013 at. And for the exchequer, in case they're watching or interested, uh, by 2017, it's paying 3.6 billion in taxes a year and will over time pay something like 25 billion pounds in production taxes. So for each pound we invest, the government gets back more than a pound in production taxes. And then we spend more as well because it's another 20 billion on top probably to operate that production over its productive life. So that's the food cycle, and that's why the government's keen we invest. It's good for us, clearly, and it's great for the UK economy. Now, we need that investment. Um, I, I have spent too many times in the last year speaking to people to explain why uh, UK GDP figures have been damaged by the performance of our industry. It is an uncomfortable position to be at. My own personal belief is, had we managed our production in a different way, then George Osborne wouldn't have had a recession last year. Now, th that's a crazy place to be at, that, that the UK economy is so sensitive to our industry, but it makes a lot of difference. We are still a big industry. We account for more than 2.5% of UK GDP. That is a big impact. Over the last two years, 2011 and 2012, production fell by about 30%. I've never seen years like it. Now, a lot of that was to do with uh, assets performing much less well than expected, uh, asset integrity, bringing things offline, post condo people looking really carefully at what was going on. But the other side of the story was, as I mentioned, 2008, 2009, investment had really slowed down. And the shadow of that cast itself four or five years down the road. So we only brought a few barrels into development in 2008 9 and they slowly came into production. So by 2011, 2012, we saw about 180 million barrels being brought into production. We saw an awful lot being produced, well over a billion barrels over those two years. And we replaced, in production terms, less than a sixth of what we actually produced. And that dynamic meant the foundations fell away on production. Now, the good news is, as you see, the wave of production, wave of investment going on now will gradually lift up our production. And we looked at a whole range of scenarios, and we are very comfortable that by 2017, production will be back where it should have been, at around 2 million barrels of oil and gas a day. And the question is, how do we sustain that, and how do we keep making that both the norm and actually a base to grow on so we see production back where it should have been, which is well above 2 million barrels of oil and gas a day. For anyone in our industry, um, it's not just the investment story, it's the operation story. The day job is running a successful business and managing to make sure that you work on, on the assets, you keep the integrity, uh, and, and you control operating costs. It's a real creative tension for the companies in this room, I know. So 2013, when we look now at the forecast, we see that operating costs have gone up yet again, and this rainbow of, of, of um, uh, curves here shows how operation expenditure has grown over this last decade. Uh, shows how long I've been doing this job as well, so maybe it's a slight frightening thing for me here, uh, looking at this as well. But compared with eight or ten years ago, oper operating expenditure was, was way under half of what it is now. It grew a lot last year, probably about 10%. But I emphasize not on every field. When we look at the distribution, many, many fields grew less than 5% in their operating expenditure for 12, 2013. Others grew quite a bit more. So it was a very diverse picture. Most, some growth, one or two, a lot of growth for, for various reasons. Some of it around in, uh, integrity work, some of it just the nature of their business has changed and they have to spend more on that operations. Also, we also see that uh, because of the new wave of new developments, there is more cost in the basin anyway. You have to run the things that you've invested in. We also uh, put on the right-hand side the bar chart just shows a sort of distribution of costs by field across the North Sea. Uh, and as I mentioned, for many fields, uh, if oil prices were to wobble, then they would feel uncomfortable. And the right-hand half of that curve and the blue bars are classical fields which feel pretty discomforted were we starting to see oil prices slip back from the current uh, highs. 
So if I've looked at what's going on at the minute and how we're emptying the store cupboard of opportunities, we need to get back to the day job, which is how we explore and find, and where we explore and find uh, the next set of opportunities here in the North Sea. And um, I put this picture up. This is just looking at exploration drilling over the last decade. The dark blue main wells, uh, light, light blue, the side tracks. Uh, and I think there are several things which catch my eye, not least in putting this story together this year. 2003 to 5, uh, exploration soared on the back of rising oil prices. 2006, it fell back. Again, the tax increase at the end of 2005 did not help. It knocked the sentiment out of the space and people started to look elsewhere for things. 2006, 7, 8, it soared up again. Yes, 2009, it fell back. This time, not for tax, praise be, but instead for access to finance. Post, uh, post uh, the oil price crash, people were really nervous and everyone pulled back from exploration. It started to grow again. And look at what happened in 2011. Exploration fell back. Nothing at all to do with the tax increase in the budget 2011, I am sure. It's not just tax, but suddenly over the last four years... Uh, we have seen exploration at a much more subdued level than it was the previous four years. So 2009 to 12, exploration averaged around 20, 21 wells a year. And overall, we found something around 0 0.8, 0 0.9 billion barrels of oil and gas over that period. With these last two years, 2011 and 2012, at best being underwhelming in the annals of exploration. There were one or two tight wells from last year, and I hope those wells come good, but it wasn't a successful year. If you look before that, 2005 to 8, again, what you see is exploration much stronger, uh, and we found just under 1.5 billion barrels of that period. So the day job, explore, do it successfully, clearly, uh, and the more wells you drill, the better you get. Uh, there's no doubt in that. It's also worth noting that 2005, 2008, generally our industry struggles to get more than 50 wells, more than 45 wells away a year, under whatever circumstances. So we need to find the conditions which get us back at that level, that rate, to make the most of the UKCS. And interestingly enough, uh, what we see now is a strong growth in exploration. Over these next three years, we think that people's plans together on exploration could signal 130 wells being drilled. Now, clearly, some of those are still a little bit of a twinkle in the eye, but in 2013, already 80% of the wells E-wells have got firm slots uh, and, and firm uh, drill rig commitments. Uh, and the appraisal wells that we know of so far this year, again, have all got uh, rig slots. So we, we expect, we hope, to see 2013 being a strong year and 2014 and 15 likewise being good years. Clearly, access to finance will remain an issue and fundamentally access to drill rigs is the issue for these things. The outlook then for exploration, I, I think, is going to be critical for our future as an industry, and what we look to see is how that will evolve over these next three years. Uh, we need better success, we need to find more, undoubtedly. We are emptying the store cupboard fast, uh, and we need to find more to come in on the back of it. It's also worth noticing that a lot of these wells are driven by license round commitments. 2000, uh, the license round since 2004 particularly, so people are under pressure now to deliver on those commitments and get those wells popped. Uh, that, that will have an effect, and I hope an effect for many years to come. So we've done a whistle-stop tour through what's been going, in our going on in our, our industry. And the plans within the activity survey cover about half of, we think, the total op opportunity base in the North Sea, about 11.5 billion barrels. So there's a half still to go at, both to squeeze more from exist existing fields and, frankly, to do more by exploration as well. Uh, and, and as Malcolm mentioned, it's essential that we make the most of these opportunities. When we look, the, uh, the opportunity set that uh, in people's eyes that we know about is like 50 fields, ranging from fields above 100 million barrels, there's about 11 of those, through to 28, which are sub-20 in size. And the day job is typically trying to get small things developed fast and then, frankly, find more small things so you can develop them fast as well. It has been made easier, I hope, by the government's behaviour in the last two years. 
over the last two years, we've been working hard, as many of you know in the room, with the government to try and get certainty on decommissioning. We can't yet fix the costs, but what we want to know is who's going to pay for what when you get there, and that we de-risk that argument now. Because as the basin matures, how you turn the lights off is critical. You want to know who's going to pay for what when, and be confident that's the case. It takes that issue off the table, not least if you're having to finance the business acquisition on mid-late life assets. Uh, all the signs are, and uh, I'm really confident that as part of Budget 13, uh, it will be announced that decommissioning certainty will be given, and the Chancellor will agree to issue contracts to industry to guarantee the government's share of the costs. Now, ours is still a day job. Ours is to pay and to do the decommissioning. We just want to know who's going to pay for the bill when you get there. And that certainty already is having material impact on some of the commercial deals going on in the UKCS. And we should be doing more of this, de-risking the government's involvement so we can trust them and they can trust us to do our day job, which is to do more from, uh, to get more from the North Sea. So, you know, in, uh, to, to wind up, as I say, from my point of view, a very exciting year, massive investment, a massive challenge as well to pull production by its bootstraps, to keep working on integrity and to keep promoting this industry. Uh, one of the things I think uh, those of us who deal with politicians have seen more than anything is finally a recognition by government that our industry is part of the fabric of society here in the UK. And that we are as much a national champion as aerospace, say, and automotive. Our technology is as amazing. What we do is simply as amazing as well in terms of our benefits to the economy. And that gradually is being recognised. Both the Scottish Government and the British Government have oil and gas strategies, not just to, to maximise the recovery from the North Sea, but to make the most of the capability of our supply chain. Uh, I'm working uh, with UKTI at the minute on several destinations where we want to try and give them the ideas better how to market our capabilities as an industry, and, and even go with them to help spread the word of how good we are still in oil and gas here in the UKCS. And on that note, Malcolm, I'll hand over to you, and thank you very much indeed.